hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Welcome to the Dukes of Gaming podcast. Thank you for choosing to hang with us for the next hour and some change. As we talk about what's happening in the world of video games, you can find us on your favorite podcast service and YouTube as well. But it's not just me here, ladies and gents, because I'm here with my fellow Dukes of Gaming. I'm here with the Duke of Rocket League. What's going on, Cole? Hey, what's up? It's a rainy day in Georgia. Um, I'm just trying to survive, trying not to go underwater. It's been raining for two days straight. Playing some video games from Ratchet and Clank, ready to talk about E3. Good to see y'all. What's going on? The Duke of Design. What's going on, Ben? E3 came and went, and I uh, hardly batted an eyelash. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, I also got the Duke of Nostalgia. What's going on, Taylor? I'm drinking. <laughs> That's always good. <sighs> mm-hmm. And last but certainly not least, I have the Duke of Education, Alfredo. What's going on, my man? Hello, I'm doing quite swell. Uh, Like Ben, E3 came and went, but I am very excited and excited to talk to you guys about uh, what went down there. Got you, got you, got you. And I am Thomas, your Duke of Procrastination. Just some housekeeping for you. We're going to be releasing a review for Ratchet & Clank, Rift Apart. You can find that on our YouTube channel in the near future. Me, Alfredo, and Cole will give you our thoughts and impressions on the latest entry in the long-running Insomniac Games franchise. Sharing in that PlayStation love, Ben's book up is coming up, and we'll be playing Days Gone, and we'll get to that next week. But this week, this week we're going over E3. Now, in our own way, in our own Dukes of Gaming way, we will be answering the age-old question of all gamers. How was E3 this year? Each of us are going to go around this Discord table and reveal our highest highs and our lowest lows. So without delay, let's get right into it. I'm going to start with my positive, and you already know what my positive is. Halo is confirmed for this holiday, y'all. I'm so happy. Yes. I'm so happy this is not a 2022 thing. I'm so glad we're getting free-to-play multiplayer. I'm so glad we're getting campaign all at the same time. We could have got a date. We could have got a date, but I'm not going to harp on that. We're getting Halo. What are y'all thoughts? It's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, Multiplayer is so exciting. Um, Free on top of that. Boom. Good to go. Uh, I keep going back to this, the, the, the trailer. Uh, that they showed because it it touched me. It really touched me in a weird way. <laughs> a, a good way, in a good way, consensually. <laughs> good way. I wanted three, it four, to. Three, three, four, three got you covered. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Go ahead, Alfredo. I was going to say, just coming from a place of somebody who's never played any Halo games, not even the multiplayer, any of the campaigns or anything, um, what I saw was really exciting, especially considering what we got last from last E3 with Microsoft um, of what they showed. Um, particularly for me, when they showed it previously, it didn't really grab me. It had like a coolish grapple hook mechanic, what seemed to be, but the graphics didn't look that good what they showed to us didn't look that good. Like it didn't inspire me as a non halo fan to get into that franchise. And with this, what we saw this year, um, how they decided to show, you know, Cortana and the story a little bit showing the graphics and how good halo looks and just giving you a little bit of that story and saying, this is what's going to be your mission this time. It kind of, uh, kind of makes me excited to try to get in there and see what, you know, what is so exciting about the Halo universe. Um, and especially with Game Pass now, being having access to all of the previous Halos and being able to get in there, you know, catch up to the story and then be ready this holiday season for the new Halo. It's just really exciting. And I think this is the one that I'm going to actually hop into. Um, and especially since the multiplayer itself is free, that could be like a really good uh, way for me to get my feet wet and then eventually get into the campaign. So I'm pretty excited for it. You know what the best part about it was? And I I realized this this week because I don't play mobile games like that. But this week I decided to play Call of Duty mobile. 
having a really good time with Call of Duty Mobile. And my first thought, I was like, I'm going to be able to play Halo online on my phone. Like, that's going to be something I'm doing because right, through, xCloud works X-Cloud? just fine. Yeah, mm-hmm. xCloud works just fine on my phone. I mean, I have access to Halo at all times. And, you know, if you have the clip, if you have the clip that clips your phone to the controller, it's basically like having a little handheld mm-hmm. console. So we were dreaming about this, like back when Halo was, you know, Xbox, you know, Xbox original, Xbox 360. People are like, portable Halo, I'll never have it. We pretty much have it now. I'm so excited. I'm so yeah. excited. I just want to note that there is still time for this to be a 2022 game. It could still be delayed. And as Don't troubled as the that. development has been, I would not be terribly surprised if that ended up being the case. You know what, though? This, this, was, this was the grand... This is the grand game of the year. This is the big game of the year. There's nothing else to compete with it this year. As far as the Breath of the Wild and, and um, for Horizon, they're going to be next year. I think well, we already know Horizon will be. And Breath of the Wild with no release date, you know. But um, that kind of, it didn't blow me away. The trailer didn't. Microsoft's whole conference was so great. And the game pass, it really, the whole package got me hyped for Halo. And the fact that I've never played Halo much past Halo 2. Played a lot of that online. Um, so I'm excited to go back and maybe play them on my iPad, play one, you know, play the whole series again, get hyped and kind of get in the zeitgeist of what's going to be a Halo fall. I think it's going to be, that just hypes me up. So I'm on Probably board and I'm ready winner. to get back into Halo. Yeah. Probably a Halo winner. Oh, like Ben did put that realism there. I do think that it's very possible it could get delayed to 2022. I sure hope it doesn't. But it is. But they get this opportunity. They could be the biggest game of the fall, and with no question, nothing else. Is there anything else to compete with it? That big game? Um, well, nothing. I, the, the only the only other things maybe? are the yeah, there are the you know the, the yeah. typical battlefield Call and Call of Duty. That, that's mm-hmm. the weird thing about Halo. It it's competing with all with so many different games. Like it's a Microsoft, it's one of Microsoft exclusives, so you have to look at it from that light. It's also a multiplayer shooter. So it's competing against Call of Duty, Battlefield. It's in a very weird spot. And I don't know what success looks like for Halo Infinite. I, I really don't selling know. Xboxes. Selling Xboxes and selling Game Pass subscriptions. That's what right. success looks like. Uh, Cole, I think mm-hmm. you said that, that Horizon is coming out next year. I'm pretty sure that Sony is still saying it's going to come out this year. God yeah, forbidden unless they for said year. this year. Oh, God, God of War? War? What, what, what was Horizon the, what was the January? Track. What was, something just got a January release. What was that? Or February release? Some big game. I thought it was Horizon. Was it not? Because I was thinking it was the same. Oh, I think you're thinking of Elden Ring. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Oh, Elden Ring. Yeah. I'm too hyped yeah. about that game. I'm mixing it up with everything else. <laughs> we'll get to that. But yeah, overall, I'm excited. Hopefully, I hope you're wrong, Ben. But I do, <laughs> I do have that in the back of my mind because I've been, I've been let down before by this game. But we will definitely. It would see. be, it would be interesting seeing, you know, if that worst case scenario, you know, Halo maybe doesn't make its original, you know, holiday release date. But I could definitely see them doing something since. Uh, you know, they're trying to do this whole multiplayer push that is free to play now. I could possibly see them releasing them not in conjunction with each other, the multiplayer and the campaign. Um, I feel like they like are trying to really craft the campaign into something that's like on, you know, Sony's level where they have Last of Us type of story or God of War type story. And they really want to curate that and make sure it's as perfect as can be. But from what we saw of the free to play multiplayer, it looks really good so far of what we were able to see. It looks fun. It looks awesome. I wouldn't be surprised if they released that like holiday. It would be the perfect timing. People are looking for something to play and it looks ready to go. So I wouldn't be surprised if they went ahead and released that and then maybe made you wait a bit more just to continue Master Chief's story itself. It's possible. It's definitely possible. And that's actually a great segue because you mentioned Sony. I'm going to get into my negative, which is we had no Sony. We had, you know, obviously we had third, you know, third party announcements um, that were coming to PlayStation 5, but they didn't really announce anything. 
And I thought that was a little disappointing. I thought if you're going to not have an E3 press conference, I feel like you should at least have a state of play or something like that. Or at least a state of play to go over upcoming games as opposed to, you know, I, I know we had the Horizon announcement. What was that like a month ago? Besides yeah, that, we don't know the slate. Yeah, only like two weeks ago. Two weeks? Oh. Two, okay. I feel like it wasn't home. It was, it was pretty close ago. But yeah, exactly what you're saying. I was kind of expecting them to come out and say something. But at the same time, we kind of did see a few press conferences that probably, uh, you know, didn't need conferences in and of itself. Um, Because we can see where Sony wins by saying, see, we don't want to be like insert uh, insert developer here (laughs) at Gearbox. We don't want to be like them and, you know, put on something that has no meaning, has no like People come out of it and say, you know, there was nothing really for you to show. Why were you here in the first place? And then it would kind of be like a bad, bad marketing kind of deal. Whereas now you have people looking forward to what Sony, you know, has coming in the future, whether that be a month from now or, you know, a couple of weeks. Who's to say? But like you say, it's ultimately disappointing for us gamers, you know, who want to see stuff from. Sony, you know, when are we getting the God of War? When are we getting what's next for Sony? Because we kind of don't know what's next other than Horizon Forbidden West. You know what? I'll be honest. Halo Infinite made me not care what Sony had to say. <laughs> I think Xbox has got me a little hooked right now. And but maybe the- maybe that's the, the the fault of Sony for not being there, uh, not doing anything. But but. So this is the same thing we we've, we've been preaching on, saying on this podcast a lot. I know I have the fact that Sony is getting complacent and they're getting this big head like they had going into the PS4 race and they think they got this big lead. They don't have to go to E3. They're too good for E3. I hate this. I hate that mentality. And I hate Sony's been doing this kind of like I don't know. I'm better than everyone else since the crossplay stuff started with Fortnite a few years mm-hmm. ago, and they didn't want to play nice. Now, and I will say, if Xbox was leading, they probably wouldn't want to crossplay. With PlayStation, but anyway, I think that PlayStation just got a big head right now, and they're they're destroying the console race, and I don't think it's good. And I think Xbox is making up some ground with the players and the goodwill. And I just I think this is a bad move on Sony's part not being here because I think they they could I have, have to imagine together. they could have, I have to together. imagine that we will see something from them pretty soon. Yeah. Before definitely before the summer's over, we will have another state of play from them. Yeah, I yeah but say, just not just, being it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Thomas. Sorry. I'll just say, I'll just, I'll be quick. I will say they did have one of the best press conferences I've seen in recent memory when they first announced the PS5. Like I, that press conference, that was one of my favorite press conferences they've ever done where they first announced the PS5 and they had all those games there. That was a great press conference. And I'd argue that was better than the press conference Microsoft just had. That being said, that was a year ago. And I feel like we should have had maybe a little bit of updates, but I think they feel that we've announced everything we have coming. Like, I think, well, Alfredo, what you were saying was kind of true. Like, we've announced all of the stuff. Like, we don't want to just come here and just say the same old stuff. I do think there's legitimacy in that, but at the same time, you kind of just let Microsoft have the free stage to just outshine you. Oh, they listen, they could have looked that they could have had, if they had grabbed Elden Ring, had Elden Ring in that in their press conference had um, the Grand Theft Auto, the next generation trailer, because, you know, I got to throw in Grand Theft Auto. But if they <laughs> if they had the, the GTA 5 next gen enhancements, you know, that trailer, if um, in, you know, exclusive to PlayStation, they have that deal. They have some kind of deal with uh, Grand Theft, with Rockstar for like, I think it's going to be free for the first few months on PS5. Or I can't remember what it was. But um, and then you hold five. the horizon. Yeah, five. What did I say? Did I say no, I just, want, I just want to make sure because um, I, I the only reason why I would say no, they try shouldn't because we know that's coming, and I'm like, there's I don't that seems like something I wouldn't want in a press conference, like more information about this ten year old game. Well, the, the well the only thing I remember, y'all, is in the PS4 for E3, I can't remember 2014, I think there was a trailer for the next gen enhancements of GTA Five. And it was everyone was hyped about it. I mean, it was. It oh yeah, that yeah, that was, was pretty that, big. Because that, that, that was the first person. Was, I remember that first person. That was the that was the thing they were stressing yeah. the most. I remember that first person. Yeah, it looked a lot better. 
I'm just struggling to think how good is Grand Theft Auto 5 or PS5 going to look? Like, how good can <laughs> it realistically That's a whole other topic, but yeah. Yeah. No. That's but, like, but anyway, I, but you I get what you're that. saying, though. They, they could have done some other things. I think Elden Ring, maybe. I think I don't think From Software wouldn't want to be at any press conference. I think they wanted to. Well, and I think they could have held that. They could have held the state of play for Horizon. They could have just held that and had a segment in their E3 press conference. And that, that would have been huge. Yeah, they I, just don't. I, they don't. I, they don't want to share the week with everybody else. They don't because they yeah. don't have to. So yeah. then we'd be saying, "Oh, Sony had one game and Xbox had this many games." You know that that that's mm-hmm. PR spin right there. So I, I think they just and said, that's the kind of mentality. Earlier. What what Ben said, they don't have to share the week because they don't have to, and that's the mentality they have. And I just feel like that's that's going to eat them up. I think this next generation Xbox will be able to make some ground on them because of that mentality. Absolutely. Maybe. I think Xbox is killing it right now. Then uh, yeah. obviously sales are going to, you know, show show the results, but you know, right now the momentum is definitely on Xbox's favor because of that press conference, mm-hmm. but it can switch up very quick with the next announcement of, you know, gameplay footage of God of War 2 or whatever they're going to do, you know. So, it's a very fluid situation. Yar, come in, Daddy. What you be wanting from old pirate Conrad Carlyle? Captain, I know I'm just a lonely cabin boy, but I heard you encounter the Boar Boys. Oh, yes. That old podcast chronicle. Yes, the tales of the Dungeons are us. I could tell you the story of their magic, their sword fighting, their dungeons, and their dragons. Or even my favorite, the buried treasure. But if you want to dive deeper into these mysterious origins of the great DRU Empire, you'll have to subscribe on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcast, boy. Now get back to your post before I let Giblet taste a bit of your flesh. That's Captain! That's Captain! Run away! Run away! Please listen to Dungeons R Us on Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and soon to be wherever you get your podcasts. Please, Captain, don't make me walk the plank again. Not again! Mm-hmm. But enough about so. Who wants to go next? Floor is yours. Okay, so my positive was, which is kind of crazy that it came out of what was this? Uh, the Elden Ring. That's that's my positive. What press conference was that? The Summer of Games, the IGN thing. S- Summer of Games. Or Jeff it, Keeley. Mm-hmm. Jeff Keeley. Yeah. Summer Games Fest. Summer of Games yes. Fest. Yeah, I, I would have thought my my favorite thing when it came out of the Xbox, but that was the press conference or or Nintendo, but it was Elden Ring, and I've been very skeptical of this game since. You know, I knew it would be good, but I just thought that it would be a Bloodborne reskinned or Dark Souls reskinned with really kind of what it looked like, except for the one fact that there is open world. And that was kind of confirmed. I think it was rumored before, but um, this is like one of my dream games has always been an open world Souls game. And it could go one way or the other. It could go it could go bad and it might not fit because, you know, they're all about level design and layering these levels on top of each other. But I always was, I always said that a Zelda, like a mix between like a Zelda and a Dark Souls with the exploration, horseback riding, open fields and, and running up into this castle and then, then getting into the layered depth of the castle and stuff like, um, it, it is unbelievable. It looks incredible. And the idea of the open world souls game to me, it's very fascinating. So to me, this was my most hype moment of E3. What do y'all think? Yeah, I was completely floored when, you know, they did their one more thing and it turned out to be Elden Ring um, because we didn't just get a CGI trailer of Elden Ring. Uh, We got a full full gameplay uh, and at the end of it, we got a release date, which I'm shocked. uh, And it turned out to be uh, January 21st, I believe, of 2022. Um, And if you asked me before this, I I really didn't think we would have seen Elden Ring uh, let alone get a release date that early. I was pretty positive that we weren't going to get see this game until 2023. 
So the fact that they were able to keep this under wraps and show gameplay that looks really, really solid, really fun. You fighting these giant monsters with some pretty cool, uh, you know, enough different differences from the Souls games from what it looked like uh, to, you know, stand on its own. Um, it it was a really great surprise. Honestly, probably the biggest surprise for me in all of three E3 this year. Um, the only thing I am concerned a bit with is its open world nature um because what i i'm i'm scared that they from software isn't going to be able to fill the world uh you know with it being an open world i hope they are able to fill it with as much uh you know curiosity and enough lore that there are things to actually do in this open world um because with dark souls in particular you know they have its lore but you really have to go digging uh, into you know all these pages they don't exactly set things up uh, where things are obvious so as long as you they can do that same thing in an open world concept but I feel like because it is such an open and much more larger space it might be a little bit more difficult to make you know the player be invested at least th that's how I feel uh, going in open world games in general. If it's not like right in front of me, then I might just, you know, feel like it's barren and there's nothing to do uh, except for, you know, the set pieces like the standalone dungeon dungeons where, you know, you have these big bosses. Speaking of the lore, look, I'm a selfish man. And this has nothing to do with From Software as a developer. I need that lore to be A1. Because George R. R. Martin took the time out of his schedule. Instead of finishing the books that he was, he's supposed to finish, he he wrote the lore to this game. I need this. This lore needs to be amazing. You know, because you don't just get George R. R. Martin for no reason. You know, that's he's a master. Like the one thing I will always give him credit for is he can write encyclopedias of his like lore for his stories. So I'm hoping that they don't move away from the formula they've done with Dark Souls and that, you know, it's less about the story, more about the gameplay, and the lore is there if you want to find it. I hope the open world setting really, like, just heightens that. Just way more to find and more interesting things to find. I think that's the direction. I hope it's not a more narrative game. I hope it's less Sekiro, more Dark Souls. Have you played Dark Souls and Bloodborne? I put a good amount of time in them. I haven't gotten super, super far in them, but I appreciate what they are. And I... Because that's like, yeah. the lore is all it is. So then this is like a match made in heaven then, because that's what they do. Like, they literally, their storytelling is told through the lore. Right. Um, Ben, what do you what do you think? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully they um, keep that direction with um, with Elden Ring. Um, my initial thought was some concern over whether the open world nature of the game, which we are assuming, though the trailer does give plenty of hints that that is the case, especially the horseback riding, mm -hmm. um, that that would dilute the excellent level design that From Software is known for. Though I was thinking about it in terms of a, you know, a, a hub and spoke model where you just think about what Demon Souls um, progression looked like, where you had to go back to the hub world and then you could travel out to any of the any of the spokes one through five and play through the levels therein. What if that hub world was? not a hub world, but an overworld. And then you still had the dungeons connected that you had to physically travel to. If you had something like that, I could see it being very compelling in, in that it would retain all of the essence of that, of their, you know, level design and the intricate corridors and, and winding, you know, backtracking mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, shortcuts and all that good stuff. Elevators, you know, the, the stuff that they're known for. Um, within those uh, dungeon areas. And then you would have the overworld to traverse through each of those areas. Um, that, that could be a cool way to handle it. And I, I think that would really justify the existence of the open world. Or 
they do something totally novel and they reinvigorate the open world genre like it sorely needs. <laughs> <laughs> that, hey, they could. That's what I'm excited about. I can definitely see them, you know, incorporating some sh- shadow of the Colossus type things with, you know, giant, these giant titans that you have to try to take down. Maybe for like one of the final war bosses or something like that. But I mean, from what they've shown already, they pretty much sold me because I do love Dark Souls games, Bloodborne, all of that. So regardless, I'm going to play it. So I'm just excited to see what differences they're going to have from all of their other games. I love the color scheme. The art design, the color scheme, to me, I never loved it in Dark Souls and Bloodborne. There's too many grays. It's just too dull looking. I The trailer for Elden Ring looked very colorful. Like, there was a lot of different landscapes. There's a lot, like, just even, like, you casting a spell just looked way better to me. Like, I'm, I'm a big fan, especially if the game's yeah. not going to be as graphically impressive as Demon Souls. I think it can make up ground in the art style that he used. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how it looks. And 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 Thomas, that's something that that I like. My dream game is kind of stepping away from when I describe it as an open world Souls game, but stepping away from that darkness a little bit and adding a little bit of more more light to it. So yeah. that that made me happy seeing that too. But uh, you want me to go with my negative? Yeah, yeah. What's what's the downside okay. to either? So. So my downside, the most disappointing thing, this was one of my predictions in our predict prediction episode. I predicted that Breath of the Wild would, would release, they would show the Switch Pro and it would release this fall. And I and I predicted co-op, but um we didn't give you the one of those. Um I think it's very disappointing that it's not coming out this year. Um I don't I thought Nintendo's press conference, I think a lot of people actually really liked it. I I was very disappointed by it. Um no Switch Pro. And no release date on Breath of the Wild. Those are my two big, big negatives. Yeah. Well, while you're saying that about your negatives, can I just can I just throw this out there? I'm just gonna gonna go back a couple episodes to our E3 predictions, where I predicted that time travel would be a mechanic in Breath of yeah, the Wild. Yeah, you did. Mm-hmm. You did. You called I'm it preemptively. Calling it. Yes, that I called it. Um, wait, wait a second. There's time travel. I didn't. I didn't pick that up. Can someone There's, explain that to me? I missed it. I don't know what happened. Since the trailer is so like haphazardly put together, it's it, it's easy to miss. Um, but there's a moment where uh, Link flies back through a rock mm-hmm. with like a blue glow around it. It's implied that it's time travel. I'm not going to say it is 100 percent confirmed that it's time travel. But, oh, but um, oh, I saw that. It was like a it was like a Prince of Persia type. Mechanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. When also, you first said it, I was thinking like time travel, like Agent Link or something. I was no, like, no, 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 no. Like <laughs> um, I love that. Moving back. Also, the music. Uh, also, the music cue, like yeah, that yes, weird yes, distorted yes, 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 sound. Yeah. Like they had that in the original trailer, and it makes sense. It's like okay, it's really cool be the sound. sound. It makes. It's I love that sound. As someone who loves like sound design, and everything mm, that's an amazing nice. sound. But yeah, mm-hmm. I. I am super looking forward yeah. to what they're going to do as far as time travel goes. Or at least, like, I don't think it's going to be we're going back into another, like, realm of Link. But probably just, you know. If we only we know. could be. If only we could go oh, into we the future and play Nintendo. it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can actually catch Mew 3 in this game. That's the, that's the trick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little disappointed that it is the same high rule. Yeah. Um, yeah. You didn't go mm-hmm. to another place, though hopefully with the whole, you know, in the sky scenario, they're destroying and deforming the map enough in that way mm-hmm. that it feels totally new, even though it's not. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a little not... different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm in the same place. I'm not a huge Zelda fan. Um, so I play the games, but I'm never like Oh, this is the most amazing game ever. But I am excited to see what new mechanics they can kind of bring uh, to, you know, revitalize this, you know, series, which I think it does need something to differentiate it from its first, you know, Breath of the Wild, which but I'm in the minority here very much. I didn't like that game a ton, so I wasn't I I can wait for this game, of course, Um, but if they could give me, you know, possibly some different protagonists, let me play as Zelda. 
um, I would be really happy because I don't know, Zel- Link playing as Link all the time, it kind of gets stale for me, just his limited mechanics, I guess. But if they give me uh, Zelda with magic and l- just allow some new new stuff like that, I'd be really happy. Um, as far as like Nintendo's press conference as a whole, though, I was pretty happy with it. I was really happy with how they introduced, uh, you know, things like Metroid Dread, uh, I, that game in particular. I'm really, really excited for that. Uh, they didn't wow us, of course. They showed some, you know, uh, Breath of the Wild or uh, the spin off, the uh, Hyrule Warriors game expansion pass. Like they, they had a little, you know, dips kind of like that where it wasn't super thrilling. But I think they gave us enough stuff that it was it was an interesting and enjoyable show for me. And I liked how they ended with, you know, Breath of the Wild 2 confirmed 2022. But the big question is, are you going to play Danganronpa again when it comes to Switch? <laughs> oh, you know I am. <laughs> I will definitely be playing that game. <laughs> Depends on what again. you want. If that gets the Switch tax, I'm not buying it again. Like, Switch that game, if, that's, if it's more than $40. I will play it. I won't play. be happy about it, but... <laughs> I think it will be, sadly, but I'm a huge fan, so I will buy it. <laughs> Just have the convenience of having that game on the Switch. That's true. I'm gonna. I'm when it comes out, I'm gonna be staring at it on the store like. But and honestly, I probably will at some point because I do. That is a perfect portable game. I'm jealous of anybody who played it on Vita. Oh yes, that's how I played it. Best way to do it. Jealous. Um, as far as Switch Pro, um, did anybody have any thoughts on that not being announced in any way? I just wonder if it's a big rumor now. Is it even coming this year? Yeah, did all those people just like uh, hear something from you know a bad check. source? Nintendo fans, we always love to set ourselves up for disappointment. Yeah. So God, we do, directs. man. Yeah, we do. That's the thing. Like this price conference would have been good if I just wasn't so hyped about the Switch Pro <laughs> and and Breath of the Wild dropping. And gosh, it's just that's been the story of my life with video games. I get I, well. My <laughs> that's another thing, though, because. If if they if there was a Switch Pro, this would be the place to announce it. Like I don't see them doing it any other time. But it is greatly needed. I feel like a Switch Pro because even in some of their trailers, I don't know if you guys noticed, but they have some frame rate dips, and I was like, hmm, Switch Pro might be able to fix this. And if it was out, you know, probably wouldn't be having these issues. Um, but I noticed it particularly on games like Shin Megami's. Megami Tensei 5 uh, that they showed off some open world kind of stuff and there were a few other games that I know I did notice a heavy you know frame rate dip that was pretty questionable it makes me wonder if they're going to launch it with um, Breath of the Wild 2 and just have it as a pack in that would that would not That'd shock be the way me. to do it that wouldn't shock me that would not shock me they'll both have a release date because we don't we still don't have a release date for Zelda so maybe they're saving it for that hmm Mm-hmm. But we could talk about Nintendo all day. Next, I want to get Alfredo. You can start with your positive or negative. Take it whatever direction you want to go. Okay, cool. Sure, yeah, I will do a positive. Uh, so what I liked most uh, in E3 as a whole this year, it w- I had two in particular. I really liked the Devolver press conference, and I really liked Tribeca Games Showcase. Um, Devolver in particular, just because of how well that they structured and seemed to really find their groove. I feel like in the past they really tried, you know, their humor wasn't really nailing, but this year they nailed it with the whole Max, uh, Devolver Max Plus or whatever it's called. The premium but Pass. But even right? better, <laughs> yes, the Premium Pass, which I will be getting a shit for. Um, <laughs> but I really, really, really enjoyed, out of all these press conferences, the Tribeca Game Showcase. Um, And this was one of the first showcases that we saw, like either it was on the first or second day. But what we saw there was a a real focus on uh, games that were had movie like experiences to them. Uh, So with the Tribeca Games Festival, usually it's like a movie kind of festival, but they dabbled into games this time and they started off by showing um, some uh, a game that involves stop motion animation uh, called uh, Harold Halibut. Um, And not only did this show the game, but they showed the creative process behind it. 
uh, which I'm a total nerd for. And if anybody loves film um, and games, this would probably the, be the one that you should go back and definitely I recommend to watch. Um, they really gave you insight into each developer and their process and how they might have started in animation or started in films and then gravitated toward the uh, games industry. Um, so I just really liked how personal it felt, how they did, you know, that developer commentary and really showed the people behind the games. Um, and in addition, the games themselves looked really, really great. Like almost everything they showed, I'm super excited to go play. Um, like I said, that the first game they showed was a stop motion kind of claymation game, which is basically uh, along the lines of Wallace and Gromit, like those types of movies. Uh, and everything in that game was handmade and they made it totally stop motion. So I'm super excited for that. The next one they showed was Kena Bridge of Spirits, which they did like a deeper dive into it. But I really appreciated how they showed uh Ember Labs, the developer who is making that game, and how they started in animation, um, kind of like Disney-esque. Um, and then they showed the gameplay, which straight up looked like a, a Pixar or a Disney movie. It looked amazing. Um, so I just really like how they pulled off their entire showcase and everything that they showed from it, honestly. It was awesome. I'm, yeah, it was really cool. Forward, yeah, I'm looking forward to all the game. A lot of the games they announced there. It was it was a pretty good selection of games. Um, from that yeah. stop motion on um, Harold Halibut to 12 minutes. Like, it, there's mm -hmm. a lot of great smaller games, smaller scale games, but smaller games matter. And I'm looking. We we we, we just got to get 12 minutes already because I've seen that <laughs> game a lot, and every time I'm like, oh yeah, I'm playing that. I'm playing that. Interestingly enough. Comes they, out they didn't even, even, it does. They uh they weren't the ones to give us a release date. Thankfully, Xbox did. Right. Um, but they had some bangers of games. The one that I'm really excited for, besides 12 minutes, is this game called The Big Con, which is essentially a 90s point and click uh adventure where you play as like this uh teenage girl trying to become a con artist so that she can, you know, make back money for her mom who took out a loan from the mafia essentially yeah. it looks super cool but they had a lot of games like that that like had these really really neat uh premises and they all look great there's a, there was another one that really caught my eye from the devolver um show that's called inscription is by uh daniel mullins the guy that made pony island and i don't know if you guys have played pony island but that game is so weird and so surprising and i just know that inscription which looks like a horror card game is going to be super surprising and interesting no matter what it ends up being. So I'm, I'm there for that day one. For sure. Both of those showcases, like they nailed their presentation to me better than anybody else did. But yeah, that was my positive. Negative. <sighs> my negative, unfortunately, for E3 would have to be the Square Enix showcase um which i was super excited about because as you all know i had one one prediction in particular that i wanted above everything else and that was to get a new king of hearts game which i did not get at all so you got chaos. <laughs> that wasn't why it was chaos i did get <laughs> chaos so <laughs> here's the thing the square enix showcase was not a <laughs> was not a bad press conference debatable i don't think it was a bad press conference because they did have a lot of good things in it they opened up with guardians of the galaxy the video game which was a super solid opening it looks like a fun game great game i want to play it um the only thing like questionable i had about it uh, was that you know you can't switch you're always star lord you can't switch to the other Guardi guardians of the galaxy but it looks like it's it's nailing the Guardians, you know, uh, their type of humor It's nailing that setting. And it looks like a fun game. Uh, and above that, we're getting it way sooner than I expected at all, which is in October this year. So that's really cool. Um, then after that, that strong opening, it started to kind of fall apart after that. Um, we started, uh, we got a lot of updates to, you know, 
games that didn't really need updates. For example, Godfall um, for the PS5, you know, they announced an expansion um, and that game wasn't pretty well received. Uh, We got an update on Marvel Avengers, but we didn't, uh, which introduced uh, Black Panther expansion, the Wakanda expansion, um, to introduce a new character and a new plot uh, that is free for all people who play that game. Um, The problem is that for me, at least, they didn't they didn't grab people who, you know, don't play that game. They didn't introduce something to say, hey, this is why you should play the game. We're doing this, this and this. They did more of uh, this is just like something new that's coming out uh, to to the story. We don't have an official date for you, but stay tuned. It was nothing that's going to grab people out of their seat to say, I need to buy this game and I need to play it. Um, and they kind of kept along those lines. Same thing with like uh, uh, Babylon's Fall. Uh, Babylon's Fall is like a is an action RPG made by Platinum Games that was released or announced rather back in 2019. And that game looked amazing when they first did it. However, now it it morphed from, you know, the tr- traditional action RPG game to a live service game that is multiplayer. So, you know, it, for people like me, it's things that it makes a game that I was so excited to get my hands on to something that I'm like, Ugh, I don't really know about that. So it that kind of seemed to be the trend of their entire showcase for me, where they were kind of like giving me, you know, things that I want, but not really presenting it in the best light and not really giving me a reason to say I want to play this game. Undoubtedly, like I need I need this game in my life. It's kind of more of like, eh, I'll play it and we'll see what happens. So, but what about chaos? <laughs> <laughs> oh, chaos! They also announced a uh, <laughs> Stranger of Paris Paradise Final Fantasy Origins, which is essentially a Dark Souls game, uh, but set in the Final Fantasy universe. Um, which actually, they said the demo was out now. Um, and then they had a whole demo fiasco where it actually was not out and the <laughs> the files were corrupted. Um, all that to say, today, gentlemen, I did pl- find they fixed the demo and I finally played it. Um, what they showed was something that looked like a PS3 game. It did not look good. They showed a super generic character with a literal T-shirt on. Uh, it did not look like Final Fantasy and it did not look like a like a next gen game, like a current gen game. Um, however, I played it and the game is good, guys. The game actually delivers. It gives, I, w- I would say, I, give it some time to get the ball rolling, but they introduced some really, really cool, uh, really, really cool mechanics and systems into the Souls born kind of. Uh, genre that make this that really makes this a final fantasy game they introduced like a job system where you can switch on the fly i am happy to report that there is gear in this game and there's levels to each of the gear so as you can switch the gear and it changes your appearance like you can actually see you wearing not a plain t-shirt but like a real cool like hooded outfit depending on class they have like all types of different gear which changes your appearance they have a really cool counter and parry system. They have a whole, like, they do really, really cool things. I suggest everyone, def- if you're into Soulsborne games, you need to try this game and try to get past, like, the tutorial and at least till you get the ma- like the second job available, which is the mage class. After that, it really starts to show its true colors and it's real good, surprisingly. But, uh, but yeah. That is a highlight out of it. That the demo is actually good, and I will be getting that game. But overall, the conference was not great. I mean, why can't they show us Final Fantasy 16? Like, just something. I mean, a little teaser. I just don't understand. They they have all these fans waiting, and they know everyone wants to see it. I mean, just give us something. I, I just they don't understand who might, makes the decision and says no. They might need the okay from Sony to do that. And maybe Sony said no. Well, maybe sure. Sony's holding it for their, already. maybe right. for their state of play. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, truth be told, I would mm-hmm. love to see more of that game, but I don't think that could have saved this conference. This conference no. did not need to happen. 
And it's not as egregious as Gearbox, which we'll get to. But it this was definitely, you know, highlighted by that Final Fantasy game, I'd say. And Guardians of the Galaxy, I feel like those are the two big hitters. But we didn't need any Avengers footage. If you're going to show mm-hmm. Avengers, if you're going to show Black Panther, show gameplay. Like, that's what you need to do. Like, I don't, like, them just showing this cinematic trailer with Black Panther and a story, it's like, no, you need to show gameplay because this game is failing. And, you know, you need to show as much as possible, you, you know. And I just have a real tangent with Avengers because I really wanted to like that game. And we still haven't gotten that Spider-Man DLC. Yep. <laughs> that was oh, man, that's right. <laughs> you know, so it's like, right, right. You know, where is that? <laughs> like, where is that? Like, where, there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of things they could have done. I think Final Fantasy 16, like you said, Cole, would have helped. But there was a whole bunch of things this conference yeah. probably needed to do that it didn't, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't surprise us, which, you know, that's what we're all looking out of E3. And I think that's kind of the whole gambit of conferences this year, unfortunately. Aside from Guardians of Galaxy, they had, you know, there was not that wow factor was missing this year for me, I think. But the Square Enix one, like you said, they could have showed different things, but I don't think it was the fact that they had, you know, nothing to show. I think they just showed what they did pretty poorly. Very good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I would say the only thing they did right was they did not show Kingdom Hearts, which is a positive in my book. Keep that. <laughs> keep that. Blasphemy. Franchise. Nope. <laughs> keep that franchise dormant until it's time. Until, until they have some different ideas, Mm-mm. you know what I'm saying? If they had announced Kingdom Hearts, I'd be like, oh, this is even worse than I thought. But no, I think that overall, this poor conference. Standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> this, it was a poor conference, but it could be worse. And we'll get to worse. Was there any other um, thoughts about Square Enix? Do better and give me Kingdom Hearts. Don't listen to Thomas. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Sarah. And you should listen to What's New? Nancy Drew. Come get a clue. Boop, boop, doo. What's New Nancy Drew is a weekly podcast where we recap the latest episode of the CW show, Nancy Drew. Yeah, so put your sleuthing brain on and join us for a good time. <laughs> All right. And the next one we'll get to, let's go to, let's go to Taylor. And you can start with either a positive or a negative. It's up to you. I'm going to start with my positive, which is that um, Shun- Shuntaro Furukawa thought that Metroid 4 was so good. He said, that filth that plays our games cannot play this. It's too good. Let's make Metroid 5 uh, and call it Metroid Dread. And I am so excited for dread i i was kind of hesitant about metroid 4 because i don't like the uh, metroid prime games all that much i don't like that sort of style of metroid i like the cat the metroidvanias i love metroidvanias and this one looks awesome it is it's spooky uh, it, it it looks like a lot of fun. Um, I, there's not really anything to say about it, uh, but it is coming out, and that's all I wanted was a new Metroid. Um, Nintendo Soon-ish is sitting too. on all these IPs. Soonish too, exactly. It's coming out in what uh, September, October? Who knows? No, uh, let me look nobody it up. knows. Um, <laughs> I think fall. Uh, I think it's fall. It's fall. Um, it's October. It's October. I thought. I thought October. Um, all I know is that it's it's an it's another one of Nintendo's IPs that they have finally dipped back into, and they they played into that. They're like, yeah, we have we have intellectual properties. We just don't care because we've got Mario and Zelda and Pokemon. We don't need to go dipping into any of our other cool games. So I I have some faith in nintendo right now because they're working on two metroid games at the same time uh metroid's a a very safe bet because it did 
define a genre. Um, and it's got a huge fan base to this day. You don't get the same stuff from, from Mother or... Um, well, you get you get it from Pikmin. And, and I think they're working on a Pikmin. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm just happy. I'm happy Nintendo's going back to their old IPs. Uh, and I hope they keep doing that. I hope we get to see more and more. Robo Chibi, maybe? That's uh, Nintendo? <laughs> Keep yeah, I'm on the same page as you. I'm, I'm, a, yeah, I'm looking forward to this uh, This more than prom. Yeah. That's a very That's good it. statement. I agree with you. I agree with you completely because I like Metroid Prime series, you know, but I don't know if I need Metroid Prime now. I think that having a bite-sized Metroid, something that this kind of leans into what I wanted Nintendo to do in terms of they used to have the 3DS and they used to have, you know, the main console games and they had the portable games. And I feel like with the Switch, they've kind of just gotten away from that. Those smaller experiences with those big franchises that we used to get with the 3DS. I think Metroid Dread is kind of that. A little more upscale. You probably couldn't do this on a 3DS per se, but it's not something as I feel as big as a Metroid Prime 4. So I think it's I think releasing games of this ilk is perfect for Nintendo. Yeah. yeah. It does look good. I will yeah. definitely I will definitely be checking it out. I I uh did So what is this about them skipping 4 and going straight to 5? At, at, during the <laughs> during the um Nintendo Direct, they uh they said we are working on Metroid 4. Please stay with us. And then they cut to black. And then it goes Metroid Five, and then it plays the trailer for Metroid Dread. Mm-hmm. So I, it, yeah, <laughs> it was it was one of Nintendo's little meme marketing schemes where they're like, "This will make some people laugh," and it made me laugh uh, as soon well, as I saw it. It's theoretically the fifth Metroid game in terms of the Super Metroid style games, I believe. I think that's what that was referring to. Sure. Sure, but yeah, but they I were leaning I, into the you, meme, you, you can't imagine. That, oh, oh, for sure. <laughs> no one sat there and went, "Wait a second, this doesn't make any <laughs> sense." Oh, can <laughs> someone, as somebody who's never played any of these Metroid games, could someone describe to me the uh, difference between the Metroid Prime games and you know something like Metroid Dread? Pick me. Like, what's the? Or is one like an open world? What's the difference? Uh, first person versus side scrolling. Basically, okay. that's a better way to put it. Yeah, it's um, you know, their Metroid Prime is started on the GameCube. That's had you know, it's the 3D, you know, just first. It's not a first. It's a first person shooter, but it's more than that. It's a lot of puzzles and everything. Um, and yeah, Metroid, yeah. Super Metroid. Okay. That those are like the Metroidvanias, they, everything of that nature. They really do just change the camera angle for the Metroid games. There isn't anything more in depth about the first person games other than this is what it would look like if you were in the uh side scrollers but facing forward. Um but it mm. it kind of it detracts from some of the puzzles, I think. I like the maps in Metroid can be confusing, so only being able to see right in front of you is frustrating to put it the least. Um. Okay. Cool. Well, at least for me, like I said, someone who's never played these games, I'm super excited for what they did announce, Metroid uh, Dread, uh, because I'm a huge fan of these Metroidvania uh, style type games. Um, I love like anything Hollow Knight, anything like that, and this seems to scratch that itch. Uh, it really seems to be like a Hollow Knight. W- Plus, like Resident Evil Three or Resident Evil Two, uh, where you know you have this big bad who is stalking you, and you kind of have to figure out ways to get around them. Uh, in addition to you know gaining all those abilities, uh, solving puzzles, like it really seems to be scratching that itch. And I'm really excited to be playing it in a few months. I'm so excited for it to be my first game. Yeah. What about that negative? <laughs> Pokemon's gonna suck. Um, talking about IPs that Nintendo has, here's one that they've stayed that stayed too long. Um, breaking with tradition, 
Pokemon did not appear at all during E3. There was nothing about Pokemon Unite. There was nothing about Pokemon uh, uh, Legends. And there's nothing about the Diamond and Pearl remakes. Those Pokemon are three Unite, games that, that they've... It's their little uh, uh, League of Legends type uh, game uh. That, that people don't care about. No one cares about. Um, <laughs> I didn't even care about it. I love them. They have three pretty big games that they wanted to push, and they didn't do any of them at E3, which is weird. I how You'll read uh, reports from Polygon or, or whatever that say they're breaking from t- tr- tradition, and this is weird. But I disagree, uh, because I'm in the Pokemon fan community. Again, like Thomas, I definitely like Pokemon. And I have seen what what we weirdos do. Uh, at E3 is when Pokemon shows up. Uh, Pokemon fans will go, that was just the trailer you showed two, three months ago with some extra scenes. We hated it. This trailer betrayed us. We're going to throw our Nintendo DSs in the sewers. And then two, (laughs) three weeks later, a Pokemon Direct drops, and everyone goes, what? They were going to do a Pokemon Direct the entire time? Uh, this has happened for the past five, six years. Um, so I'm not surprised Pokemon didn't show up. But a little bit when they have bigger announcements to make. If it was just Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remakes, I'd be fine with them not showing up. But because they're going with weird new avenues with Pokemon Unite, which is a, a multiplayer, you know, brawler, and they're going with... Um, uh, Legends, which is this weird open world thing that runs at five frames a second so far. Um, we <laughs> want to see more. Uh, and it's Pokemon's 25th anniversary. They should have shown something. Um, it really does not instill good feelings in me. Uh, it, it makes me think that the game's going to release and it's going to run at fr- five frames a second. And isn't this too Zelda's um, Zelda's thirty fifth anniversary year? Too? It's ever no? it's everyone's it's Wario's twenty fifth anniversary. <laughs> it's Mario's twenty fifth anniversary. It's it's my twenty fifth anniversary. anniversary. Or is that next year? I was thinking about the Zelda. Uh, Zelda. Thing. I don't know. I think Zelda. Um, I think Zelda does have an anniversary coming up. I think it's yeah. it'd be the same as Mario's probably right because they were released around the same time. But this is like this is the thing though. Like why Nintendo? Just give us something. Like, give the fans something. Like, Taylor wanted something with Pokemon, and they daggum had it. They could have given him something, you know? And they, they could even the they could have said, hey, uh, they could have come out and said, look, this is just a glimpse into the future. We're just doing this for our fans just to get you excited. There's going to be Boom. a Pokemon just show us in two weeks. Th- no, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, but I'm, I'm even going farther. I'm saying... Uh, show us a snippet of what you're working on for Mario. Just a snippet, just a little tiny tease. Sure. I don't even care what it is. Just get people hyped up and just say you, you, they can even preface this with "This is far out." Do they yeah. need to? Uh, yeah, a gong. Yes, they do. They like I to. think that no. they, they know that I don't how think they need to get hyped up. They're in the same y'all, place as Sony. Y'all, is. but look, they don't need. Either. But listen though, before before mm. Sony had. Two killer E3s, and I think that was very substantial for the run that they made. That 2013 E3 Sony had was incredible. And the 2015, was that the one where they showed the uh, Final Fantasy VII remake? And it was like literally Sony just, it was like uh, kind of funny refers to the year of dreams when they came out and it was just boom, boom, boom. They were dropping just Horizon. I think Horizon was right. there. Yeah, I, I remember what you talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, Sony used to kill E3. But and- those... I know they don't need to, but like, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting your fan base and getting someone that's on the Xbox side. Look, I got so hyped up watching that Xbox conference and as I thought it was really good. Makes me want to go buy an Xbox. I wanted to buy an Xbox and I've been looking for one since that conference. And you, that's what I'm saying. Like, they don't have to, but they can build hype and, and, I, and not even hand off all their cards. Like, they could do a Pokemon Direct, direct two weeks from now. Give us something. You know what I mean? I know they don't have to, but I feel like just blow it out the water every year. It's E3. I, Come on. I get what you're saying, but how I look at it is Microsoft had to do that. Like Microsoft, 
I can't remember the last time they had a good E3. At least in this console generation. Like, I don't yeah. remember the last time where I watched the Microsoft press conference and was blown away. I can't remember. I don't think it was ever. And Nintendo, in those, like, the first two years of the Switch, there's there were some great directs. Like, there was, some, I don't know if it was E3 per se, but yeah. they had some amazing directs where we got Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey basically announced. Like, they that first year of the Switch, when they were doing all the announcements, they put the legwork in. It's unbelievable. So now it's pretty much they're coasting and selling consoles left and right. Xbox has to prove themselves. They mm-hmm. have, they're trying to sell consoles. Nintendo's selling consoles now. Sony is selling consoles now. So they don't need as heavily as Xbox to gauge, like get support. They already have it. I think Microsoft needed E3. They I know. couldn't I, afford to not be there. And Microsoft did. The, Exactly. They need it. Nintendo and Sony don't. But why not just put that pedal to the metal and keep on rocking and rolling? You know, like just just drive through 100 miles an hour. Keep on. Maybe it's because the Switch broke. Because it's less it's less ammo for another day. If they show what Mm -hmm. they've got now, they can't show it next year when they when it would look a little nicer because they already revealed it. As you can only reveal a game for the first time once. Mm-hmm. So you got you to make sure that when you do, it's the right time. Not, not necessarily to say that Nintendo always chooses the right time or that any of these companies <laughs> do, but it's... Well, I would be thinking it's E3. You could reveal something. They've already revealed Breath of the Wild. But, like, they could... Re- I feel like... I mean, maybe they don't have anything ready to reveal, but it just seems like they could do a reveal of something, like, like the next Mario, and then next year really dive into it. I don't yeah, know. I feel like I'm kind of with Cole here in that, but I definitely see both everyone's point here. Like Nintendo obviously does not need to do it because Pokemon's going to sell Game Busters regardless of what they show when they show it. Um, but it would be really cool if they did take an approach this year, uh, kind of how Xbox did. Xbox had their regular showcase, which they did game after game. Everything's come, come to Game Pass. Uh, and then the next day they were like, hey, we're going to do this extra Xbox extended event where we're going to show you a little bit of trailers of the games you didn't see. So we got, they announced that they, they were going to show, you know, Hellblade. Hellblade was missing. They're going to show it. Um, and then when their extended edition came out, they did like a, not a deep dive, but it was more of the developers talking about, hey, this is the game uh, that you guys know and love, but like more. And we're giving you like more of developer con- commentary on what they're trying to do with the next game. Um, and in addition to that, they showed what they said is not a game trailer, is a montage of what we're working on. So they showed like a lot of like uh, like the scenery that they were uh, like the art that they were gathering to make the game. Uh, the like very, very brief glimpses on like the character art, stuff like that, just to get people excited for the game. So I think that kind of would be the best of both worlds uh, where, you know, the gamers get what they want. They get to see, OK, this Pokemon game isn't going to suck right now. We kind of don't know because we don't see yeah. anything. But uh, and so we would be we would be content and happy with what we get. And the developer developers don't have to exactly show their hands, but they're Nintendo, so they can do whatever they want. <laughs> That's a perfect way to end that. Nintendo is going to be Nintendo. <laughs> and hopefully we get a little more by the end of the year. That's what I'm hoping for, at least. But last but not least, I want to get to Ben's positives and negatives of E3. I'll start with my negative, so we can end on a positive. My negative is Gearbox's whole thing at E3. What? It was so great. You didn't <laughs> yeah, like it? Yeah. <laughs> um, it was totally useless. To- totally unnecessary. Big waste of time. It was... Most of that conference was Randy Pitchford walking around the back of the set for the Borderlands movie and and talking to a couple people about how great the Borderlands movie is going to be. And they didn't even seem like they wanted to even do that. No, it didn't seem <laughs> planned or, or, you know, you know like, what are you doing all. back here? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, who's this guy? <laughs> um, yeah, so that was awful. And, and the one thing that was that was great about the showcase which was Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which is, you know, this fantasy sort of spinoff of Borderlands. Um, 
had already been shown at the Summer Games Fest the previous day, and then was shown again at <laughs> another conference, I think mm-hmm. Xbox is. Um, so why they did that, and it was like basically the exact same trailer with no gameplay, no idea. They had these interstitials every five minutes where they were like, here's a little thing about Homeworld, and then it faded out awkwardly and said like, Homeworld 3 is coming. Rather than just doing like a segment on Homeworld, they had to keep doing these little interstitials. And then they had like the Gearbox University interstitials, which were like a a diet Devolver Digital where they were like Mm -hmm. making fun of their fans for buying (laughs) microtransactions when they have no leg to stand on because they're the ones that are selling them on Like Devolver. (laughs) So it doesn't, it, it just didn't make any sense. It was, it was super bizarre and didn't need to happen at all. It seemed like they just tasked the intern with figuring out like a layout of how they're going to do this. And they just rolled with it. Nobody proof checked it. They just went, they went ahead and just had to put something out. And that's, that's a waste of everybody's time. That's a waste of their money. They could have just used that. I, I would have preferred them to just do a random press conference sometime later in the year with just more information. Yeah, actually show actually show gameplay of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, and you know, that's, yeah, that's really the only game something. that looked interesting to me. Everything else was just kind of you know whatever. But yeah, Tiny Tina was the only one. I'm like, I might play that. Hmm. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. I was going to say along with Tiny Tina's, kind of how you mentioned Ben, that game, you know. That game is the fantasy Borderlands that everybody wanted. And the information, the most information that we got from that, like you said, was actually from the Summer's Game Fest, where, you know, after they showed the small little trailer teaser clip of what they had, uh, one of the voice actors from the game, Tiny Tina uh, herself, which is Ashley Birch, um, she talked, did like an informal kind of interview with Jeff Keighley, who hosted the Summer's Game Fest and was answering some basic questions about the game as to, you know, what will the combat be like? What's involved? Uh, You know, what exactly did we see, basically? And that's in Gearbox. We didn't get any of that. Like you said, we just got the same exact trailer that we got and then they just moved on. Um, And that was really the only game that they had of consequence that everybody wanted to see. Um, And with the Borderlands movie itself, they didn't show like any character reveals, like costume reveals, nothing really. Um, Like you said, Ben, it was just Randy Pitchford just going around and, you know, hanging out on the set, which isn't the most exciting thing for people to watch. <laughs> there were there were no reveals to it, and that's what they were missing. It was it was just boring. It was the it was encompassing the phrase, this could have been an email. This could have been a newsletter, could have been an article on IGN. Guys, I was able to find a positive out of the conference. Them bringing up the Tiny Tina announcement made me realize, oh, Ashley Burst is the main character for Tina. And I didn't realize she had done so many other games. I go on a Wikipedia page, I find out all these other games she's been. She's been on um, Aloy. She was Danica Hart in Miles Morales. Huge. She was in Last of Us. I was like, oh, she's a really good voice actress. That's the only positive thing. A Wikipedia search of that. That's the only thing positive <laughs> I got from this entire conference. <laughs> Besides that, got nothing. Well, at least we got that. Uh, I guess I'll move on with my positive <laughs> now. <laughs> my positive um, was Bethesda's presence at the Bethesda slash Microsoft showcase. Um, Xbox's portion of it, I could take it or leave it. I'm not a big Halo fan. We already talked about Halo. Um, but specifically Bethesda's involvement, they talked about, they showed Starfield which was my prediction that they were going to show Starfield. I thought they were going to do the whole blowout Fallout 4 treatment and just, you know, launch it this fall. Instead, it's going to be next fall and next uh, November, looks like. And um, we didn't get much other than a teaser and some words from Todd Howard after the fact about how it's a Han Solo simulator and it's Skyrim in space, essentially, which is, um, you know, what I guess I all of us expected more or less um still don't know what the details on that are you know how exactly is it a han solo simulator and skyrim in space but um 
we will <laughs> we will find out more i'm sure probably next year for it that's probably exactly what we all want is it not i mean it sounds it sounds fun it sounds pretty good sounds fun um but yeah we did we didn't get much else uh from starfield yet um we did see you know the doom the the doom eternal upgrade for new consoles um still coming to ps5 which is one of the only things that is coming to ps5 from this show <laughs> um th- then we also had the fallout 76 uh update with the pit was looked awesome i'm i'm like i think i need to play fallout 76 now because i the pit was a dlc from fallout 3 uh, it takes place in you know in pittsburgh and it looks what they showed in this teaser for the pit expansion in Fallout 76 looks so Fallout 3. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be all over that. So um, that looked pretty awesome. Um, but the real kicker was what they ended the show with, which was um, Arcane Studios' new game, um, which is called Redfall and is very peculiar. Um, what do you guys all think about Redfall? I like the art style. I like, I wish we had gotten some form of gameplay. Like some, just something. It could have been just like how Elden Ring was, where it's not gameplay per se, but it's like you're you're showing in-game situations. You know, I wish we could have seen something more of that, just to get a, a better feel of what this is. As far as I understand, it's more of a co-op game. And so that yeah, yeah. interesting. I'm like, hmm. That could go either left or right. I want to see it before I, you know, form thoughts on it. But the aesthetic looked really cool. And I like, you know, the the undead vibe that it gives off. But yeah, I need to see more. For whatever reason, yeah. it reminded me of Gotham Knights a little bit. But in first person, mm-hmm. I don't know why. It goes to the co-op in the streets, nighttime and stuff. But it looks cool. But I'm not a big first person shooter fan so that's kind of a bummer because i really like the art style and the way it looks um but i'll wait and see yeah it's yet to be determined how shootery it's going to be um it, it you know it seemed to be fairly shootery from the uh from the trailer but they're all we're also the you know sig- signature kind of arcane superpowers um that that figure into it as well mm-hmm. yeah for me when i saw this trailer I was super excited um, just because they really seem to be going all in on like the vampire shooters, which I don't think we've really seen. We see we've seen zombie shooters all the time, you know, with Left for Dead and Back for Blood, which is the next game that's coming out from that same team. Um, but uh, I don't know. This CGI trailer seemed to uh, really lean into like the uh, I guess more of like the interpersonal relationships between the four characters that we saw here, um, how they were doing banter between the, each other, how the scenes like were cut together to like kind of show a story and so- be somewhat comical. Um, I just really like how all of the the characters were working with each other and how they seemed to bounce like everything off of each other. Um, it definitely seemed like a game that I will for sure be playing just based off of the uh you know the trailer itself hopefully the gameplay is good but it, like you said it's from arcane studios they did dishonored and uh they had a little bit you know little bit of powers in there uh like a good variety so i know that that it, the powers that they have in this game will probably like feel solid and be fun to play as um, but I believe this is the first time that the studio is doing something uh, multiplayer, like co-op driven. So it's going to be interesting seeing um, how, you know, how well they're able to adapt their signature Arcane Studios formula to a multiplayer game. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, they, they've been testing the water with multiplayer for a while now. There was a uh, add on mode to pray that allowed you to kind of do, it was like a hide and seek or, or, you know, oh. um, yeah, it's, it, it, hide and seek esque mode in, in prey that was multiplayer. And then death loop has a multiplayer component to it as well, where you can invade another person's game as a, as an antagonist. Um, so yeah, they, they, you know, were a firm single player studio for a while and, and, uh, have been, you know, inching more and more into this multiplayer realm, but, Yet they're not making wholly different types of games to mm-hmm. suit that. 
which is which is I, I like. And if they can successfully really translate the 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 what's great about games like Dishonored and Prey into a co op environment, it could be a really really great boon for that studio. And it could be finally you know like Arcane games are amazing and they always tend to review well, but they don't sell well with the exception of Dishonored. How do you um, feel, Ben, about the fact that this one is going to be open world? Because I believe this is like the first time they'll, they're doing something more open world and less level design, right? Like less level level. I don't know. It depends on what, what form it takes exactly. I, 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 don't, I, I don't recall it being, um, it said, was it, oh, did it say in the trailer that it was open world? Uh, I just pulled up an article and says Redfall is a new co-op open world first person shooter. So I gotcha. think they mentioned it after it dropped. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I think, you know, Prey wasn't exactly an open world because there were discrete level loads. Although, I mean, some open world games have level loads into buildings and that kind of thing. Um, but the, sta- the space station was one huge thing that, you know, had like made geographical sense and you could navigate mm. through it. Um, in Prey, that. right? In Prey, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas Dishonored, Dishonored was like separate zones that you could not travel between. Mm. Um, their level design is really, really good. I think I think they are the best in the business of, at level design in these types of games, especially. So I, I have faith in them. Yeah, and what's great is they don't have to worry about sales anymore because Game Pass came. True. So mm-hmm. I think that that's going to be, they're probably the studio of the Bethesda studios that benefits from that the most because... You know, I think a lot of people might just try it out and become fans yeah. of it. Go back and play Dishonored, Dishonored 2, Prey. You know, I think the Game Pass really can benefit them more than even some of the other studios they've acquired. Um, Because, yeah, they can, you know, delve deep into that. You know, you can see what, Red, what it's called Redfall, correct? Mm-hmm. You can see what Redfall's doing. If they like that. Go back, mm-hmm. you know, it won't improve the sales per se, but maybe improve just the overall amount of people who know about the games. Yeah. Yeah. Would be great for the studio. And let's end it on a high note or a low note, depending on how you like this E3. I'm going to go around and just quick thoughts. And I'll start with you, Ben. How was E3? It, it, meh. 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 Yeah. Cole, how was E3? <laughs> I'm on the same page, man. It's just uh, Microsoft's one of the best ones of best conferences they've had in years. But overall, it was a pretty big letdown. I liked it to begin with, uh, but it kind of faded from my memory pretty quickly. And Square and Nintendo didn't help with that. It just <laughs> kind of flatlined. Um, and I think that sums it up. It, it's just like one big flat line where it, it happened, um, but we survived. <laughs> <laughs> For me personally, I think, uh, I think I'm, well, I'm definitely a higher note as far as E3 goes than the rest of you guys. Um, I think this E3 let us down in terms of, you know, big gangbuster announcements that we're all looking forward to when it comes to E3 especially when it comes to the Sony, Nintendo, um, and Xbox. Um, But for me personally, there were a lot of indie games that I found out about that I'm super excited about. There were a lot of surprises where, oh, this game is coming out like this year, like in the next couple of months. There were enough of those moments that I was like, okay, I have this here, this here, like, I have a lot of things to look forward to, especially on the indie front, um, that I left E3 being pretty satisfied with everything that was shown. Um, Now, could E3 have been coordinated a little better where, you know, where multiple showcases and multiple shows had the same exact trailers and were showing the same exact games? Most definitely. Um, I think especially with things like the Future Game Showcase, uh, like the PC Gamer show, like stuff like that, we started seeing a lot of things we had seen earlier. But in between those, you know, things that we've seen before, there were some hidden gems where, oh, this is new and it looks pretty cool, so I'm going to take a peek. Um, It just seemed like we had to, you know, 
dig some, do some digging this year in order to find the things that we're really interested in, as opposed to them being, bam, here's a game, bam, here's a game, you know, game after game of, you know, just hype. So hopefully they can figure that out in the future, but I'm happy with what I got. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on the same page as you. Could have been better, could have been worse. I, I'm willing to grade this on a curve because this I is mm-hmm. the first not in-person E3. So I'm willing to grade on a curve since there was a lot of different moving parts. It was better than I thought it was going to be, but definitely not up to the standards of previous E3s. At least some of the, you know, heavy E3 like, needs that lot of element. dreams. You know, PS4 era E3s, you know, it's not mm-hmm. anywhere near that, but it wasn't horrible. What were you saying, Cole? Um, E3 needs the live element to me. It, it's ex- when the games, when they announce the game and the game, the, the crowd goes crazy and they get a pop and stuff like that makes E3 for me. I feel like that's that's part of the experience is having all the the crazy fans in the packed in the Sony press conference and the Microsoft. And then I don't know, man, that was, that was always really fun to watch and watching these, these pre canned trailers and stuff. It cuts to the point. It cuts a lot of the fluff out and the awkwardness out, but like E3 is enjoyable when we get to watch, watch all that, all that stuff go down live. I think we can end it on that note. Cause I think we all agree with that sentiment and hopefully we get that next year at E3 2022. But for tonight, I want to thank you all for watching or listening to the Dukes of Gaming podcast. Again, you can listen to us on your favorite podcast service and watch us live. Leave a like, a review, a comment, anything to help support the channel. Hit the bell and get all notifications when we release our podcast. And look for us every Monday on all podcast services. Thank you. I bid thee farewell. <laughs>